for us Brazilians. <laughs> it was actually my ninth wedding anniversary with my wife, so I decided to do a different program with her, right? Instead of going to a restaurant, I bought us tickets, drove six hours to see a historic moment, and so I did. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm glad. I want to start by congratulating the German nation. The German soccer team was marvelous. They really deserved it. And uh, all right. So <clears throat> let me start today. So this, uh, my talk is intended to be somehow more informative than, well, I don't want to get too much into detail here, and technical details. So despite being a kind of technical subject, I'll try to make it as uh, less complicated as possible, and then you let me know at the end if I succeeded or not. Okay, so essentially what I want to do is sum up uh, some work that I have been doing over the last couple of years uh, on these uh, so-called extremal functions, and then uh, with uh, lately some applications to number theory, right? Hilbert spaces and bounds for the Riemann zeta function. All right, so let me start. I'll divide this talk into three parts. So the first part, I'll talk about this extremal problem uh, of Berling and Zellberg type. And uh, well, I don't expect you to follow all the details in all the slides just to get the basic idea. But the, the main problem that I'll be talking about today, the motivation for it, is this uh, extremal problem here. I give you a, a real valid function. And I want to find functions of exponential type that approximate this function. In the best way possible, right? So given an entire function f, given a real, fu a real function f, real value function f, I want to find real entire functions l and m, such that l and m have a prescribed exponential type. Uh, l is below f and m is above f. And subject to condition one and two, uh, l and m minimize the l1 distance to f, okay? So this uh, one-sided condition here is important for applications. Of course, you could consider the same problem of just approximating the function f, but this is a pure approximation theory problem. It's not good for application. Well, here, exponential type is, of course, this quantity. And it's uh, pretty much related to the main important thing here is that <coughs> it's related to the support of the Fourier transform. Right? So the exponential type finite uh, plus some decay condition on the line means that the support of the Fourier transform of the function is contained on a compact interval. Right? Exponential type tau support contained on the interval minus tau over 2 pi, tau over 2 pi. Here I use a classical Stein's notation for the Fourier transform with 2 pi i x. Okay. Uh, as I said, previous work on this by Bernstein, Krein, Akizer, and Nagy uh, on the pure approximation problem without the one side condition. And then, at least to my knowledge, the first one to consider this problem was Berling on the 30s for the function f of x signum of x. I'll show in the next slide uh, exactly what it is. And then Zellberg in the 70s, Logan for the characteristic function of intervals, then Valerie in the 1980s for this exponential function here. So a typical picture of this problem is this, right? So here's Berling's original construction for the signum function. And the blue function here is the best function of exponential type 2 pi that lies above the signum function. Zellberg in the 70s had the clever idea to combine two signal functions with a shift to produce a characteristic function of an interval. And of course, if you sum the two majorants, you get a majorant for the characteristic function of the interval. This is not always optimal, but it's a simple enough construction to yield for a lot of applications in number theory connected to large sieve inequalities, Erdős turan inequalities, Hilbert type inequalities, and so on, so on. Uh, so this, this in the 70s and the 80s were so-called magic functions, because it was very convenient to somehow have a characteristic function of an interval popping up on a certain place, and you substitute for a majorant that has the Fourier transform compactly support, and then do a lot of calculations with it. It's much simpler. Uh, there's pictures of Berlin Zellberg. Uh, well, what? <laughs> of course, you can consider this problem in the full generality, right? If you want to, to be very hardcore, you can uh, say, well, OK, so now I, let's move to dimension n. And let me give you a compact, convex, symmetric set K and mu, a no negative Borel measure on Rn. And I give you a function from Rn to R. I want you to find me real entire functions L and M of several complex variables such that they have 
distribution of Fourier transforms supported on a compact set K, they M majorizes F and L minorizes F, and subject to one and two, they minimize a certain L1 uh, metric with, with this weight, D mu, right? Posed in this full generality, this problem is very complicated. Well, the problem was very complicated before. Oh, I think my pointer, my pointer stopped working. I don't know. Uh, and the only previous work on this uh, several variables was done by Jeff Baller in 1996 when he considered the functions, the characteristic functions of balls, and then with my compact convex symmetric set, the support of Fourier transform being a Euclidean ball. Of course, you give, you can give a concept of exponential type. The concept of exponential type in several variables is now connected to a convex compact set, uh, <coughs> and it depends on the set that you choose a priori. All right, uh, let me give you a baby example to show you what are the difficulties in this sort of problems and uh, <coughs> how we can proceed. So the base, the simplest example that I can think is this: what I call the one delta problem. This is a problem that uh, you can all you can ask your students in the qualifying exam. <laughs> I usually do that in IMPA. So uh, find me a function f, which is integrable with Fourier transform supported in minus 1, 1, such that f is no negative and f of 0 is bigger than 1. So you want to find a function which is no negative, but it's bigger than the delta at the origin, f of 0 bigger than 1 in this sense. And you want to minimize the integral of f. What's the minimum value of f hat of 0? Right? And I'm going to give you three ways to solve this. Uh, first is the classical way that uh, people thought about this problem for a long time on this, on this way. Uh, you need two weapons here to attack this problem. You need one weapon to prove the existence of such a majorant, and you need a weapon to prove that such a majorant that you produce is optimal. And uh, for example, you can prove optimality here using the Poisson summation, right? Of course, if you have your function f, which satisfies these properties, sum of f of k, sum of f hat of n, but f of k, f being bigger than 0 everywhere and bigger than 1 at the origin. So the sum of f of k is, of course, bigger equal than 1. And being f with support in minus 1, 1, sum of f hat is just f hat of 0, which is the integral that you want to calculate. So you get by Poisson summation simply that f hat of 0 is bigger equal than 1. Plus, you get some conditions for equality here, right? For this equality to happen, f has to be 0 at all the integer points and has to be exactly 1 at the origin. Since f has to be above, uh, above the zero function on the, on, on, the, on the other integers, you actually have that it has to touch. You get the derivative at that point. Because it's non-negative and it's zero at the integer, so you get the derivative at those points. And you sort of have uh, these interpolation formulas to reconstruct a function given the values at the integers. right? So this, if, if you give me a function with Fourier transform supporting minus a half a half, the information at the integers is enough to reconstruct the function. This is known as like Shannon interpolation theorem if you want. Right? But if I give you a function with supporting minus 1, 1, you can e either give me the information at the half integers, or you can give me the information at the integers plus the derivative at the integers. Right? So this is the spirit of this formula. If I give you the information at the integers plus the derivative at the integers, you can reconstruct the function uniquely. And with this information, I, I find that this function, sine pi z over pi z squared, is the best function for this problem, and it's unique. Right? So this is the answer. That's way one. Uh, nice. Way two. Well, and this way two is the one that's going to be generalized in a minute. Uh, again, if I have a non-negative function of exponential type 2 pi, we are transform support in minus 1, 1. Then I can write this non-negative function as a square of a function of half of 2 pi. So this is a classical result of trying uh, Fourier transform of d support in minus a half a half. Now, I'm going to consider this Hilbert space of L2 functions with Fourier transform support in minus a half a half. This is what I'm going to call Cayley Wiener space of type pi. Okay? Of course, this is a Hilbert space just because of the uh, Fourier inversion. Uh, and then the optimality here does not follow from the Poisson summation, which is an L1 result, but follow from Plancherel's identity, which is an L2 result, more convenient for us here. You start by trying to write the L1 norm of f. This is the object that you want to minimize. But f is g squared. So you have a, the L1 norm of f is the integral of g squared. 
But the integral of g squared in the new exponential L here is the integral of g hat squared. But g hat is just supporting minus a half hat. So now instead of looking at g hat as a function on the whole line, since it has support in minus a half half, you can look at it as a periodic function of period one. And uh, use Poincaré again, but now here these are the Fourier coefficients of the function g hat. So this is actually the sum of g of n squared. And this is the sum of f of n, and you get back to the one that you had before, which is bigger or equal than one. You get the same thing as before, but through an L2 process instead of an L1 process. And the existence, you, you gotta have to prove that you find a function that has the right interpolation properties. Because here you got a function that has the right interpolation properties here for this to happen. I will not get into too much detail on this part now. Uh, and the solution three for this problem is that if you observe that the Paley Wiener space of type pi is a Hilbert space, uh, and it's more than Hilbert space, it's actually a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, right? Of course, you can write a function g on this space just by Fourier inversion as the integral from minus a half or half g at e to the t pi i w t. And then if you apply, well, that the uh, integral of g hat f is the integral of g f hat, you get exactly this formula here. So the Fourier transform of this guy on this interval is this ju just this k. And this is just the inner product of g against this k. So you can write g of w as an inner product of g with a certain function on your space. Note that the function in the space, right? Whenever you can do this, this is reproducing kernel Hilbert space. The evaluation functionals, whenever you evaluate a function at a point, these are continuous functionals in the space, right? And then, let's see how we can solve our problem. Now, you start just with the fact that f is non-negative and f of zero is bigger or equal than one. f of zero is g of zero square. g of zero square is g scalar, this reproducing kernel at zero, k of zero dot square. Here you use Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Biggest invention of all humanity, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so this is less than or equal than g square and the k of zero dot square. But g, the, the L2 norm of g is just the L1 norm of f. And then the L2 norm of k zero dot is just k zero dot scalar k zero dot. But then here you use the reproducing kernel property again. And then this is just k zero zero, right? So you find that, and k zero zero, just plug in here, this is one. So you find that L1 norm of f is bigger or equal than one, if you want it. And moreover, you find a condition for equality here, just the condition on the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. You find that this g has to be a multiple of k. The right constant is one, so g has to be a multiple, has to be equal to k, which means that f has to be equal to k of zero x squared, which is just our function sine pi x over pi x squared. So three ways to verify this. Well, let me just tell you what is known about this problem, and then I'll move to the applications, right? So there is one part of the talk which is actually a, a part in approximation theory, in constructive functions. How do we construct these majorants and minorants? And the second part of my talk is why do we care about these things? Uh, so what I think is the most robust framework, so I've been working on this problem since around 2009, 2008, 2009, and uh, just to report what I think is the state of art on this. In the one-dimensional case, so let's start with the one-dimensional case and with the Lebesgue measure. So that Berling and Zerberg had considered the signum function and the characteristic function of intervals. There is no a priori general way. If I give you a function, you can solve this problem. Each function has a different, is a different battle to kind of generate these majorants and minorants and prove that they are optimal. But we found a very you know, robust framework, uh, which is the following. We can solve this problem for the Gaussian function this is my work with uh, Friedrich Liebman and Jeff Waller, 2010. We solve it for the Gaussian, which is already an entire function, but not of exponential type. Uh, and we put a free parameter here, lambda. And the, the majorants of this function will always interpolate at the, will always touch the function at the integers. And the minorants will always touch at the integers plus a half, independent of lambda. So this suggests that we can integrate this free parameter lambda against the measure b nu and produce a new function g of x, and we can somehow integrate the majorants and integrate the minorants against the parameter lambda and produce the solution of the problem for this g uh, just by integrating against a certain measure, right? This measure has to have some special conditions on this measure, uh, but in particular, you can consider, for example, any finite measure here. We can actually consider a little bit more, but I uh, will not enter too much into detail. So we have this, uh, for the Gaussian, 
And two years later, we did this for the odd Gaussian and the truncated Gaussian. The odd Gaussian is just the Gaussian multiplied by sigmum of x. I'm missing a pi here. And the truncated Gaussian, I mean just, um, which is 0 on the negative axis and the Gaussian on the positive axis. And again, you can integrate this function against uh, suitable measures to produce new function. Well, this gives me a method to generate the solution of this problem for even functions, odd functions, and truncated functions. And we already had for characteristic functions of intervals. So I consider this a, a, a good start. I mean, it's unlikely that you will need a function that not, that one would need a function that not falls under this scope uh, of being even or, the, or truncated. But anyway, uh, and how do we go now to considering this problem for other measures instead of the back measures and other dimensions? So th this, this theory is now connects with the theory of uh, the branch spaces of entire functions, which are the right generalization of uh, the Paley winter spaces for this case. And let me brief explain to you what is the branch space. If you have seen this before, this should be fairly natural. But if you have not, this should be fairly non-natural. So I don't expect you to learn this in, in one minute. Because <laughs> a lot of time to learn. But bottom line is that you start with the base function that you call E. right? This is an entire function. And throughout this, the next two slides, I will always write E star as E of z bar bar. So it's another entire function. Uh, a hermit Beeler function is an entire function that satisfies this property here. E star of z is less than E of z in absolute value for all z's on the upper half plane. So E of z is bigger than E at the conjugate of z for all z's in the upper half plane. So this is the hermit Beeler condition. condition. A typical example is when you consider this E of z equals e to the minus i pi z. Actually, this function here will give you the paley winner space. Right? And the De Bruyne space is actually the space which I'm calling h of e. Is the space of entire functions f such that this L2 norm on the real line is finite against this measure e of x to the minus 2 dx, and such that f over e and f star over e have bounded type and non positive type on the upper half plane. Bounded type means that they can be written as the quotient of two bounded and analytic functions on the upper half plane, and non positive mean type. For any function of bounded type, you have a so-called nevin linear factorization. And this mean type pops up. It's this quantity here. Right? Uh, you might have seen this with a different constraint. Uh, you, you can also say that these functions f over e and f star over e belong to the Hardy space h2 on the upper half plane. This is totally equivalent to this. Uh, this is a Hubert space. Uh, when e of z is equal to this function, this gives me exactly the paley winner space. As a matter of fact, when this base function that you start e has exponential type, so this is essentially the space of functions that have exponential type less than or equal than that function, uh, such that this norm is bounded. Uh, more than that, this is a reproducing kernel Hubert space. The evaluation function of R continues. And uh, this is the inner product. And if the reproducing kernel is given by this expression here. right? If you label A to be a half of E plus E star and B to be I over 2 E minus E star, then you can write E of z as A minus IB. A and B here are real entire functions. They are functions that are real on the real line. So you're just writing E as A minus IB. The reproducing kernel has this expression here. right? And if you evaluate F at the point W, this is the same thing as taking the inner product of F against the kernel K of W dot. I'm missing a parenthesis here. The inner product of E. right? Let's see what happens when I take e of z to, my, to be my e to the minus pi i z, then my de Bruyne space is just the paley winner space. This function a here is just cosine pi z, and this function b is just sine pi z. And this reproducing kernel k is the one that I had before, sine of pi z over pi z. Right? So everything makes sense. Uh, what is nice about these things is that, uh, before I move to the next slide, uh, remember I showed you the second proof where you had an L2 method using orthogonality to, to exploit the problem. Here, you have an orthogonality also, right? So this, the orthogonality relation that one has to use here is that these functions here, these functions that I'm calling k, well, the chalk is uh, dissolving. 
So I don't think I can write here. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have new chalk? New chalk? Thank you. So this 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 function k uh, at at the point c dot, they are orthogonal. As long as you take this c to be the roots of say a, or the roots of this function b. <coughs> They're orthogonal in this space. So this is the relation, the orthogonality relation that you need to use. Uh, to give you that this plancher else theorem, this nonlinear plancher else theorem. Now I have my hand all dirty. dirty. Uh, all right, so what can we do with this? Uh, so I told you that we can solve it for weighted measures, but we cannot do for all sorts of weighted measures. We can do just for measures. We can solve the original extremal problem with measures d mu being given by this, e to the x minus two dx, where this function e of x, which is the hermit biller function, satisfies some uh, technical properties here. So e has to have bounded type itself, no real zeros, the function e to of i z has to be real entire, and these companion functions a and b that I defined on the previous slide uh, cannot belong to the space so that I can use that orthogonality property. Right, this is well known, the theory of uh, the Brown spaces. Uh, well, and just to state to you the, what we did over the last two years, so this is my work with uh, Friedrich Schlittmann. We solved this problem for the exponential and the Gaussian, and we can also integrate the parameter lambda. And uh, with my student, Felipe Gonçalves, we solved this problem now for the odd and truncated exponential and integrate on the parameter lambda. And with uh, Faisen D, Friedrich Schlittmann, Michael Milinovic, we solved for characteristic functions of intervals. So this is, I mean, the classes of interest, at least for me, even functions odd, truncated, and characteristic functions of intervals. Uh, I'll show you a little bit how to apply these things. Well, you might, you might say, well, these measures are not exactly generic measures, right? I mean, like, can I give you a measure and you can say that you can write like this? Not exactly. But this is where and why I find this so beautiful and I, where the whole magic happens. So let me give you a very bad example and nasty, you know? Y you might start looking at this function and uh, you guys that are working on Bessel functions will like this. So this is, you consider this function A nu and B nu just to be Bessel functions, you know, multiplied by a certain power of C. So this, this is the functions related to the Bessel functions J nu and J nu plus one, right? And you form this function E nu by saying A minus IB. So these are real entire functions. You take A minus IB. I claim to you that this is a hermit biller function that satisfied my technical properties P1, P4 on the previous slide. And this is a function of exponential type. This is actually exercise 228 on the branches book. I'll tell you the story about the branches book later. <laughs> and uh, magically, you have this identity. For any function on the branch space, you have that the norm against this, this measure, e nu minus 2 dx, is equal to the integral of fx squared against a certain power measure. This is very mysterious to me and very beautiful because this is not equal to this pointwise at all. This is completely crazy, and this is completely different from this, but whenever you take a function on the space and you integrate against these two guys, they give you magically the same number. So that's what allows you to solve, for example, the original extremal problem with this measure, because ultimately you will do a L1, L2 reduction on the branch and bring your functions to this branch space, and here you have this magical identity. Right? So this is what we do. So what we can solve in the multidimensional case, we can solve it for the exponential and the Gaussian and a class of radial functions. Now I'm using the bold font to mean several variables. Uh, and we can integrate on the free parameter lambda. We can consider now any sort of power measure, x to a power dx, or any sort of measure of that type because, well, when my compact convex set is the Euclidean ball, right? Here you have to do a symmetrization. If you want to majorize a function in several variables, what you do is that you can symmetrize your majoring using the group of rotations, and you make your majoring radial, and then you bring the problem to a one-dimensional problem with a different measure. You gotta pay this price here, multiplying by x with minus n plus one. So as long as you fall with the original problem on the real line that you knew how to solve, you are okay, all right? And then my two students, Felipe Gonçalves, Jose Ramon Padilla, and Mike Kelly from the University of Texas, are doing this uh, 
analogous problem, but now not with k being a ball, but with k being a cube or a parallel pipe. Right? Just to show you a little bit how this, this, this thing is, well, I think we've got a pretty good knowledge about this problem, what's going on. But there's a lot of nice questions open here that I don't know the answer yet. And one is very simple. is this called one delta problem. So let me give you a generic uh, compact, convex, and symmetric set on Rn. And I ask you to solve the one delta problem with respect to that compact, convex set. Meaning, what is the best known negative function such that f of 0 is 1, which has the Fourier transform supported on that k? Minimize the L1 norm of f. Say if, if k is, the, is an hexagon on, on R2. I have no idea what the answer is. Right? I believe that the answer should be inversely proportional to the volume of k. And my only belief for this is just that I know how to solve for balls and cubes. <laughs> and it seems to be the case for these two, but I, I don't know if this is the answer in general. But you can give it some thought. OK, so this is, uh, this is uh, enough about the constructive function theory. Now let me show you a little bit of how we apply this function, right? So I'm going to give you two applications. The first one is to uh, use these functions to give some bounds for objects related to the Riemann zeta function under the assumption of the Riemann hypothesis, right? So the basic objects that one, to cons one wants to consider here are the, well, the basic objects of a complex valid function are the absolute value of the function and the argument of the function. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, so assuming, the, so assuming the Riemann hypothesis, Littlewood in 1924 proved three interesting bounds. And the first, the bounds are in red here. He first found a bound for the modulus of the Riemann zeta function on the critical line, zeta of 1 half plus it, absolute value log of this is less than or equal than log t over log log t. S of t is the argument of the Riemann zeta function at the point 1 half plus it. Well, it's actually 1 over pi times this argument. Uh, and he also proved that this is less than or equal than log t over log log t. So this argument, the way you do this argument is that you start at the point 2, that you know that z of 2 is a real number. You baptize the argument there to be 0. And then you go from 2 to 2 plus it, and then to 1 half plus it, and take the continuous variation of this argument. So this is what I'm calling s of t. And, uh, you can take all, another quantity of interest here is the antiderivative of the argument function, this function that I'm calling S1 of t. So Littlewood also proved that S1 of t is less than or equal to log t over log log t squared. So these are the three Littlewood estimates in red. Uh, these estimates were never improved in 90 years, never improved in the order of magnitude. The order of magnitude is still this. Uh, the only improvements have been on the constant that one can place here in front. And I'm stating here what were the best constants up to a recent date. So for this first estimate, the best constant was due to Sander Arjan in 2009, 0.372. For this one, best constant was, for, was from Goldstone and Gonick, C a half. And for this one, the best constants were due to Fuji. Well, these are two constants. On the positive side, 0.32, and on the negative side, minus 0.51. We have improved these three results. and. Here it is. So the first theorem is due to phi shen d and Sandra Arjan, 2009, then improved the constant for the absolute value of z of 1 half plus it. They replaced the point 372 by <coughs> log 2 over 2. And then for the argument for the s of t and s1 of t, we improved the 1 half to 1 fourth, and we improved the other constants by placing this optimal pi over 48 and pi over 24. Optimal with the existing methods, right? So this is an improvement of a half on the previous constant. And this is roughly an improvement of h times what were the previous constants. Now, the idea to prove these three results is essentially the same. It's to reduce a problem in number theory to a problem in Fourier analysis. And the idea is to, you have a representation lemma to write uh, your objects, the objects that you are considering as a known function of t. So you want to evaluate this object at the height t. You want to write it as a known function of t minus a sum over the zeros. So these gammas here are the imaginary parts of the zeros of the zeta function. So I'm assuming the Riemann hypothesis. So my zeros are 1 half plus i gamma. So I can write my objects as a known function minus a sum over the zeros plus an error term, big O of 1. And uh, these functions that appear here at the sum of over zeros, 
functions that appear in this first one, f, and then here a g, and then here an h, these are not random functions. These functions have a certain nature uh, connected to the problem. So this, the function that appears here, f, is equal to log of 1 plus x squared over x squared. This crazy function appears here. This g is this arc tangent of 1 over x minus x over 1 plus x squared. And this h that appears here is this crazy function here, 1 minus x arc tangent of 1 over x. Somehow these three functions popped up. So now what you want to do is you want to evaluate a sum of a certain function over the zeros, over the ordinates of the zeros of the zeta function. How do you do this? There is a formula in analytic number theory called the Ginan Veil explicit formula, which says essentially that if you have a function that is smooth enough, if you have a function phi that is real analytic on a horizontal strip, right, and has some decay on this horizontal strip, then you can sum phi at the zeros of the zeta function. Right? Phi at two points is a phi hat of zero. There is an integral of phi with a certain uh, gamma logarithm derivative of the gamma function and a certain sum of the Fourier coefficients of phi against the von Mangold function here. I don't want you to memorize this formula at all. I don't want you to know this formula at all. I just want you to know that there is a way to find the sum of a function over the zeros of zeta. But we cannot apply this, because to apply this formula, you need some sort of regularity on, on this function phi. There has to be a real analytic on a strip. Our functions on the previous slide are not even continuous at zeros. Right? So there's no way that you can apply this to this function. So the way to proceed is to actually replace the function by a majorant or by a minorant, thus generating an inequality. And you want this majorant to have some nice property. And for this particular problem, it happens that the nice properties that we need, for example, are that the Fourier transform is compactly supported. Because you have a function here, you have an infinite sum here at the bottom that involves the Fourier transform of, of phi. So if, if this phi had the compactly supported Fourier transform, this would make your life much simpler. Right? And also, you have a phi hat of 0 there. So you want somehow to not change that, that much. So the idea here is to just replace, say, your function g by a major m of exponential type delta, so I'm calling here m delta, major of exponential type 2 pi delta. So let's say we a transform is supported minus delta delta. Well, if you had this major, then you can replace g by m hat, and then you can use the explicit formula to now sum this m hat, right? And the rest of the proof here is just uh, careful asymptotic analysis of this term, right? You will have to use the qualitative description of m uh, to evaluate these two terms. And here, there is an integral involved the logarithm derivative of the gamma function. You have to use two. And on this last one, you use the information about the Fourier transform of m hat and partial summation and the prime number theorem to evaluate this. It turns out that the main term will come from this, this integral here involving the gamma function. All the other terms will be error. At the end, you have to choose your parameter delta, the support of the Fourier transform. You have to choose it correctly. You have to choose it in terms of the t, right? But this is the main idea of the proof. Now, the question comes up. Well, you gave me a nice, very method on the first part of the talk, uh, but the method was not very, you know, uh, explicit. You just said that you can construct for the Gaussian or the truncated Gaussian, and you said that this was powerful because you could integrate against some measures. But now I have three explicit functions here that need to be taken care of. Can you do this with your method? Is your method robust enough to cover these three functions? And the answer is yes. And I'm presenting to you here how we can integrate the Gaussian against certain finite measures to produce these three functions. So for example, the, the second function, g, arc tangent of 1 over x minus x over 1 plus x squared is the integral of the sine Gaussian. This is a odd function against a certain measure of lambda. And the measure of lambda is given by this. And believe me, this is a finite measure and non-negative. Right? Same thing happens for the h function. And for the f function, this is a simpler measure. No. <coughs> uh, well, that goes for this application. And then my part three is actually to give a, a brief account of what we have been doing recently. <laughs> this is a recent work that I did with Fai Shandi, Friedrich Lippmann, and Michael Milinovic. Uh, on these sort of extremal problems in Fourier analysis related to the pair correlation of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. So not to bore you, just talk briefly over the last 10 minutes. Uh, the setup is the same. 
z is the zeta function here. Uh, the zeros are denoted by rho sigma plus i gamma, generic zeros. You have the zero counting function. The zero counting function counts the number of zeros up to height p. And it's well known since the time of Riemann that this zero, the, the number of zeros up to height t is approximately t log t over 2 pi. The goal, and this started with Montgomery, was to study the pair correlation function, which is n of t. I give you a parameter beta, which is to count the number of pairs of zeros. So I'm just labeling here the ordinates, number of pairs of ordinates of zeros, gamma and gamma prime, between 0 and t, such that the difference gamma prime minus gamma is at most 2 pi beta log t. Why, what is this number? Why do we have this 2 pi beta log t? This is just a normalization. So what I'm counting here is then, since the, the, the number of zeros at the height t is t log t over 2 pi, what I'm counting here is the number of pairs of zeros that are less than beta times the average spacing. So this would be the average spacing at the height t, right? This counts the number of pairs of ordinates whose difference is less than or equal to beta times the average spacing. <laughs> well, uh, in 1972, Montgomery conjectured that this n of t beta is approximately the number of zeros up to high t times the certain factor. Integral from 0 to beta, 1 minus this measure dx. This somehow suggests that the zeros are not equally distributed. If the zeros were equally distributed at all heights, this pair correlation function would not see this term. It would just be equal to the n of t. So this suggests that there's some somehow some it's there are somehow skewed. Uh, uh, well, if you know that, uh, then you know the asymptotic of this when beta goes to infinity, right? The integral from zero to beta of this measure is approximately beta minus a half plus the term of one over beta plus big O of one over beta square. So we want to find the goal here is to find bounds for this object. Uh, say, fixed in beta when p goes to infinity that uh, somehow look like this, right? And here is the measure of interest, right? So here's the picture of these guys. Uh, this is a famous story of a protuberance meeting over the tea time at the institute in 1972 when Montgomery, who was a graduate student, went to Princeton to show his results. And he was suggested to talk to Freeman Dyson and show his, uh, what he had found about this, this kernel 1 minus sine pi x over pi x square. And then Freeman Dyson was the one who recognized this kernel and said, hey, this is the same kernel that appears in my computations with random matrix theory, right? This is the percolation function for the eigenvalues of random matrix, uh, random Hermitian matrix. And this was the birth of this whole connection between number theory and uh, random matrix theory, which gives a lot of jobs to many people today, uh, which I find is very nice. So. Uh, the goal that we had in mind here was to somehow improve this old classical paper of Gallagher in 1985 on, uh, on I think it was, yeah, it was on the Krell journal. Uh, he found, so he considered this, uh, these two quantities, the limb soup, so fixed beta, consider the limb soup of nt beta over n of t, and the limb inf of nt beta over n of t, and then he proved that assuming Rh, so here is all conditional, for beta half a natural, you have that u of beta is less than this. And you have to put a technical assumption here. If almost all zeros are simple, then you have that the lower bound is bigger than beta minus 1 plus the error term. Remember that the true value should be beta plus 1 half, right? So here he's giving 1 half up and taking 1 half down. And he proved this just for beta natural number. Uh, what was his idea to prove this? So Montgomery found a formula, and again, this might be overly complicated, but he found a formula to evaluate uh, somehow the correlation of zeros when you plug in a test function r, and there is a certain weight here. Well, a Poisson kernel is a weight. But if you plug in a certain test function r and evaluate the gamma prime minus gamma multiplied by the normalizing factor, and you take the limit, this is going to give you r of 0 plus this guy. So, but Montgomery found that this was only true for a function r, which was integrable with Fourier transform supported in minus 1, 1. If you could plug in the characteristic function of the interval minus beta, beta, and this formula, this would give you the percolation conjecture. 
but you cannot plug in the, the characteristic function of an integral there. You can only plug in functions that have Fourier transform support in minus one one. So what do you do? What Gallagher did was to, well, I, I cannot plug in the characteristic function of the integral. This is the function that would give me the conjecture, but I can plug a major and a minor end of the characteristic function of the interval. And of course, I want to choose these guys as good as possible. And as good as possible means now optimizing this quantity. I want to optimize, well, the L1 norm against this pair correlation measure. So this is exactly what I've been talking about for 45 minutes. I hope you understand me, right? <laughs> You're not sleeping yet. Uh, so this is what Gallagher did. Whenever he plugged in a major end uh, of the interval, he would find an upper bound. Whenever he plugged in a minor end, he would find a lower bound. And of course, now the, the difficulty is to optimize this guy and this guy, right? Find major ends and minor ends, evaluate these guys in terms of beta, which is a non-trivial task, and if possible, do this in an optimal way. Uh, what he did was, he did for half the integers, and he used the berlin zellberg major ends and minor ends for characteristic functions of intervals that I show you in the second slide. These are not optimal with respect to the pair correlation measure. He knew that, but these are simple enough to, for him to do the calculations. Right? So this is what he did. And also, he solved what I'm calling here the two delta problem with respect to the pair correlation measure. So he knew he was not doing the optimal possible thing, but he considered the difference between a major and a minor. So this is a, a function that majorizes the two deltas. Majorizing, I mean, it's a non-negative function that at the points plus and minus beta is bigger than one. And he, he tried to find uh, the solution of this problem to see how far he was from the optimal solution with this method. And he succeeded in doing this, again, for beta uh, half a natural number. Why did he do this? Well, because when beta is half a natural number, then the interval minus beta, beta has integer length. And then these functions, these berlin zellberg measurements, they are very explicit functions with a finite series. So those are very simple to do computations and so on. So what we did in this recent work, this is, by the way, all that I'm talking today is in the archive. If anyone is interested, all the papers are there. Uh, we actually computed this, uh, this, this value of the m of r beta plus minus for the family of berlin zellberg measurements, but now removing this condition here. This is good enough to give explicit asymptotics in beta. And moreover, we actually solved the extremal problem in, in its full generality. So the solution is so complicated that it's not, uh, very simple to find asymptotics in terms of beta, so this is why we decided to include this, right? Uh, let me just give you an idea of this. So this is the, uh, what the answer that you get for the upper and lower bounds when you plug in the berlin zellberg measurement. You found this is the main order term, and this is the remainder, right? Of course, when beta is a half an integer, this is not here. This is all zero. Uh, the proof uses, now you have to take care of the infinite expansions of these guys. OK, uh, this is a work of Jeff Waller in 1981. And you have to analyze the asymptotics carefully. So this is the picture. So this is what it should be in black. This is the upper and lower bound, uh, what had been done just for beta and half the naturals. Now it's done for all uh, real beta. Uh, and now let me just show you briefly the solution. How would be the solution of this problem in general? Again, now I start with this measure here d mu 1 minus sine pi x squared over pi x squared. What's the goal? I know how to solve these sort of problems if I give you uh, the branch spaces, uh, the branch space. So I have to find a the branch space E that is the right the branch space for this measure, such that the E of x to the minus 2 dx is not equal pointwise to this, but such that for all functions in the space, the magical identity will hold. Uh, let's see. I want to suppose I want to solve the delta problem here, like the one delta problem that I mentioned to you before and the two delta problem that I mentioned again. So the one delta problem is non-negative functions such that r of 0 is bigger than 1. And the two delta problem is non-negative functions such that r of plus and minus beta is bigger or equal than 1. You want to minimize this, this uh, L1 norm with respect to the pair correlation measure. The idea here is to consider the space. Now I'm considering Pw of pi mu, the class of entire functions of exponential type at most pi such that this norm, now the uh, L2 norm against the d mu of x is finite. Right? And of course, you write Pw of pi as the Paley-Wiener space classical. Right? So you have the measure 1 over 
1 minus sine pi x over pi x square, and you have the Lebesgue measure. First lemma is that I claim to you that these two spaces are the same as sets, and the two norms are equivalent. Right? Uh, why are the two norms equivalent? Of course, if you take the norm with 1 minus something, you get less than the Lebesgue measure. Right? So one inequality is trivial. And the other inequality, why is this norm with the 1 minus something, because it has a singularity at the origin, why does it still control the L2 norm? This is because of the uncertainty principle. Because, because of the singularity at the origin, the mass cannot be too concentrated at the origin, because the functions have to compactly support the Fourier transform. So a part of the mass has to be outside of the origin. And if 70% of the mass is outside of the origin, the two measures there are comparable. So you have that the two spaces are equal set and the norms are equivalent. Which is great, because you know that the Paley-Wiener space is, a, is a, a space where the functionals, the evaluation functionals, are continuous. Well, if the evaluation functions are continuous in one space and the two norms are equivalent, the evaluation functionals are continuous in the other space, too. So the function that takes a function to a point to a value f of w is continuous on, on my space that I call h here. h is my Paley winner with the fair correlation measure. Well, but if the evaluation functionals are continuous, it means that there exists a magic reproducing kernel such that f of w is equal to the inner product of f against this guy on this space. Right? This is the inner product. And the question is, who is this reproducing kernel in this magic pair correlation space? And here is the answer. This is the pair correlation. This is the reproducing kernel for the Hilbert space with the pair correlation measure. Now, if you have the reproducing kernel of the space, it is very easy to solve the one delta problem, as we saw on the third slide. To solve the one delta problem is the very same solution using Cauchy-Schwarz that we did. And the answer is, again, you have to be have to have a multiple of the reproducing kernel as your best solution. So this solves the one delta problem. Uh, the solution of the two delta problem to majorize plus and minus delta, plus to majorize to be one at plus and minus beta, also falls into a general problem in Hilbert spaces. So you just have to you have to solve this this general problem in Hilbert space. If I give you a Hilbert space over C, uh, and I give you two non-zero vectors v1 and v2 with the same norm. I consider this set J of uh, vectors x such that x scalar v1 is bigger than 1 in absolute value and x scalar v2 is bigger than 1 in absolute value. Find the minimal value of the, an element in this space. And I give you two spaces. I want to, to make these conditions hold. And then, well, this is a basic problem in geometry of Hubert space. You work a little bit and you find the answer. Uh, the answer is this. And this gives us the solution of our two delta problem. Uh, I won't talk much. We can actually solve the, the problem of majorizing and minorizing a characteristic function of the interval with respect to this measure. The solution is, is rather complicated. But uh, the bottom line is that the difference between the major and the minor is actually exactly this guy. Note that when beta is not an integer, when beta is half an integer, this guy is not here. So the only thing that Gallagher saw was this thing. But this should be here. Uh, a little picture of this is a uh, little picture of this is given by this guy. So the difference between the upper and lower bound is less than this. So whenever beta is small, say our upper and lower bound are, are well relatively close. Of course, the upper and lower bound is, is are always the difference between the upper and lower bound is always less than one. But uh, here is considerably less than one. Uh, well, just to finish, I told you that I was going to give you a De Bruyne space such that this magic identity happens. For all functions, there is a, a space E such that r of x e to the x to minus 2 is equal to this pair correlation measure. And the De Bruyne space is given by this guy. So you start with the big K that I showed you on the previous slide. You construct this function L of w z 2 pi i w bar minus z times k. And this E of z is L of i z over L of i i 1 half. This is contained in problem 49 to 53 of De Bruyne's book. Well, if you have never seen this, if De Bruyne's book is a very 
unique book, at least in my opinion, because I, I mentioned the problems by heart because the problems in the book are part of the theories. And in order to move to the next section, you have to have solved all the problems before because he leaves part of the theory in the problem. So he goes to section four and says, by problem blah, this happens, by problem blah, this happens. And you're screwed if you're not solve the problem. That, this was very hard to me when I was a grad student. I think I gave up on page three. I started studying page three, but nah, I mean, this is too hard. And then I decided, I gave another try at INPA last semester. I would say, hey, I have to learn this thing. And the best thing to learn something is to actually propose a, a course. So I proposed a topics class, and we got together with a, a very nice group of students. And uh, we, we pretty much covered like uh, half of the branches book. It's a big book. Uh, doing all the exercise. Uh, these guys did much better than I did <laughs> when I was at their age. Uh, there is a fun story. Of course, in the beginning, few of them were, were finding it very hard, the book to follow. And without my knowledge, one of them had the idea to write to the branch himself. <laughs> so he wrote an email, found the email of Professor Louis de Branch online. He said, Dear Professor Louis de Branch, uh, I am a student here in IMPA, and I, we are taking a very nice class on your book, uh, which is a very nice book, but very hard to follow. I wonder if you had additional lecture notes on this that I could follow, blah, 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 so best regards, blah, blah, blah. Professor De Branch replied in one day, and the answer was like this. Dear blah, 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 you were right about one thing. My book is indeed a great contribution to analysis. <laughs> You should see my proof of the Riemann hypothesis, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes on about 15, 20 lines of blah, blah, blah. I, I think I'm correct, right? Th then you can tell the stories about these guys. So he's a character. I, I had never had the chance to meet him in person, but I really admire his work. I know that uh, uh, this sort of Hubert spaces are very, are very, very interesting. There's very magic. And uh, well, with this, uh, I want to finish my talk just uh, making you an invitation. Uh, as you know, in a couple of weeks, in three weeks, uh, when the ICM starts, I'm going from here to, to Korea, we'll be presenting a bid to host the ICM in 2018 in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we are very confident that uh, our bid will be accepted. Well, I have to make sure that Germany is not competing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if Germany is not on the run, I am confident that we have a good chance. And if this indeed materializes, you are all invited for the ICM in Rio in 2018. And thank you very much for your attention. Guys.